Good morning and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mvemba Pezo Dizolele, Senior Fellow and Director of the Africa Program here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I'm joined today by Jason Stearns uh, for this event on addressing the, rise, the rising tensions between Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Jason Stearns is an assistant professor at Simon Fraser University and the director of the Congo Research Group. He's also the author of two books, Dancing in the Glory of Monsters and the War That Does Not Say Its Name. Welcome, Jason. Thank you, Mama. The tensions, uh, tension between the Democratic Republic of Congo and Rwanda are on the rise once again as the security environment in Eastern DRC further deteriorate due to intensified fighting in recent weeks between the Congolese army and the resurgent M23 rebels. Kinshasa accuses Rwanda of backing the M23 rebels, while Kigali accuses the DRC of supporting the Front Démocratique de Libération du Rwanda, known as FDLR, a Rwandan rebel group which Kigali alleges abducted two Rwandan soldiers. As the two governments continue to swap blame their historically strained diplomatic relationship is under immense pressure. This conversation will unpack the history, this conversation will unpack the security environment challenges in Eastern DRC, explore the tense relationship between the two countries, and identify diplomatic resolutions to this dispute. Jason, we know that when President Chisekedi came to power, he made it clear that he wanted to build what he called bridges of peace with his neighbors. That position, of course, has never been popular among his own people. Um, from what I understand, the Congolese would like to have peace with Rwanda, with Burundi, with Uganda, with all their neighbors. That's kind of the mindset of the Congolese people. But the Congolese also would like to have some preambles to those, some conditions, namely justice, grievances that are long-standing that both countries should address on both sides so that they can move forward. We've seen this in other countries, Germany and France after the war and so on. But that doesn't seem to be happening. What is driving this resurgence on the M23? Well, I think the, for me, I think a good starting point is November of last year. Now, obviously, the M23 is an armed group that was defeated militarily in 2013 through the result of considerable international pressure, as well as an offensive led by the Congolese army uh, and the United Nations. Um, but the problem was, after it was defeated, the remnants of the M23 fled to neighboring Rwanda and Uganda, where they stayed. They, uh, were offered, were given sanctuary, more or less. And their problems were never solved. In other words, the, the remaining several hundred M23 soldiers uh, wanted, had demands, conditions to come back to the Congo. They were not being arrested in the countries where they were. And so their, their, their fate was left up in the air. And uh, numerous attempts to try to find some sort of solution for them, including by through trips to Kinshasa by M23 delegates, um, uh, remains only partially answered. And so starting uh, several years ago, members of the M23 led by their commander, Sultani Makenga, started small skirmishes, attacks around uh, the tri the tri-border area between Congo, Rwanda, and Uganda, around the town of Bunagana in the eastern DRC. This then escalated in November of last year. And so the question is, why did it escalate in November of yes, last year? Well, I think there's there's two main reasons. In part, as I just laid out, the M23's problems had never been solved. And so they wanted to push their own agenda to create leverage uh, to pressure the Congolese government to answer their, their demands, to be reintegrated, to be demobilized, whatever the list of demands, there's a long list of demands. They provided amnesty. Um, and this, I think, was came in the context of the launch of the new demobilization commission in the eastern DRC. Um, this demobilization commission then triggered, I think, the and not just the M23, several many different armed groups in the Eastern DRC want to see their you know their grievances addressed through this demobilization commission. So that I think the internal reason 
is, is that. It's the M23 trying to figure out what their future is. But there are other geopolitical, I think, very important reasons behind this as well. And the reason I mentioned November of last year is November of last year is when um, Etienne Tisekedi invited the Ugandan uh, army into its territory to conduct operations against a variety of armed groups, especially the uh, Allied Democratic Forces, an Islamist armed group that had just carried out, that allegedly just carried out a very brutal attack in downtown Kampala. Uh, and so these operations that began in November of last year, called Operation Shuja, between the two countries, um, created, I think, geopolitical ripple effects in the region. Why? Because relations between Uganda and its southern neighbor, Rwanda, are, have always historically been tense. Remember that Uganda and Rwanda fought several wars on Congolese soil between 1999 and 2000, and then numerous proxy wars between various proxies of theirs subsequently. And so um, when the Ugandans intervened in the Eastern Congo, the reaction from Rwanda, uh, very clearly in private to diplomats, to other interlocutors was, why are they doing this? This encroaches on our own what they consider to be their sphere of interest. Just like the United States has a sphere of interest, just like other countries have spheres of interest, Rwanda considers a part of the Eastern Congo in its sphere of interest for a host of reasons, security, economic, uh, political. And so what Rwanda saw, they saw the Ugandans intervening just to the north, uh, and not just intervening militarily, but the Ugandans um, had a deal with the Congo where they would intervene militarily, but there was a host of economic initiatives as well. So the, the Ugandans have a, a very large contract to be rebuild roads. Um, they're also engaged in gold mining. There's a Ugandan company very close to the Ugandan presidency that obtained uh, gold mining permits in the eastern Congo. And to the south of Rwanda, the Burundian army, in a much more muted fashion, was also intervening militarily in its part of the eastern Congo in South Kivu province. And so you, Rwanda, in between Uganda and Burundi, sees all this happening and feels that it's being sidelined, feels that it's been marginalized. And as so often in the, in the Congo, violence is a tool of geopolitical leverage as well. And so whereas there, there is no certain proof at the moment, there is certainly, I think, quite a bit of credible, um, quite a few credible indications that the Rwandan Defense Forces have provided backing to the M23 rebellion in the Eastern Congo. And so I think that is the broad geopolitical uh, context, and those are the two main reasons that I would see behind this resurgence of violence in the Eastern Congo. Thank you very much there, Jason. But it seems like there's a lot really to dissect there. It looks like the M23 is as local as it is international, and those drivers are equally as local and as international. So on one level, if I understand you correctly, the M23 is really the epitome of the various failed peace processes that have taken place in DRC. Would you agree with that? I mean. They claim that they had deal with the government and that failed and therefore they're coming back. Um, will you speak a little bit to the tradition or over the last, the, last, the last two decades where so many failed deals or agreements or bad decisions really have led DRC where we are today with the M23? Well, I think this is important. And let me start by saying that the Congolese government, because it's weak militarily, uh, weak politically, it finds itself in a position where it is forced to repeatedly engage in peace negotiations with a whole host of different parties. Uh, the M23 in particular, but not just the M23. Remember that uh, the Eastern Congo is host to 120 different armed groups, roughly, several dozen of whom are actually serious armed groups. The M23 actually, despite all of the international outcry over the M23, is far from the deadliest or more, most brutal armed group of the Eastern Congo. That, uh, title goes either to the ADF, this Ugandan Islamist group, or to Kodeko, which are, is a, a Congolese armed group. And those armed groups operate, both of them, in North Kivu and Ituri. And so the Congolese government is, is weak. It finds itself, because of this weakness and because of its inability to impose itself militarily, constantly forced to the peace negotiation table. Um, and so I think that state weakness is, is core to understanding what's going on at the moment, but it's also core, and I think this has been a mistake of the international community, um, weakness itself has become a means of governance and rule, and violence itself has become a means of governance and rule. And so in part, 
this weakness that I speak of is yes, it's because the Congolese state is a new state, it's finding its footing and all this, but in part, uh, la faiblesse est entretenue, as they say in the Congo. So the weakness is being cultivated to a certain extent. Um, and weakness also serves the interest of a whole host of actors, army generals, uh, ministers in government. Um, and I think this is poorly understood. And so this is how, as the Congolese would say, la violence devient un fonds de commerce. It becomes a currency it becomes uh, a means of livelihood for so many, from the political elites to uh, the militias on the ground. And so when you see, to come back to your question about peace process, failed peace processes, you know, I think at the core of this is understanding, well, what are the interests of the Congolese state? Why is it so hard for the Congolese state that has an army of 130,000 people, at least on paper, to impose itself against armed groups like the M23 that are, you know, maybe the M23 has... Uh, between 500 and 1,000 combatants at most. Um, these other armed groups, none of them are very large. And so I think understanding state weakness and how people benefit from the peace processes, you know, the peace processes themselves are also a, a source of, uh, of a financial and political benefit. And uh, from state weakness is at the core of all of this. But in the case of the M23, what will you to what will you attribute those failures? Because the M23, not only there was involvement of DRC, you know, the Congolese army, the UN, but then also, you know, really the first time around in 2013, that's when we saw the creation of the Force Intervention Brigade. So it went beyond just the Great Lakes. We had Malawi, Tanzania, and South Africa intervene, yeah, to clear Eastern Congo of the militias and other armed groups, but M23 was the big target, and they really vanquished the M23 at that time. So what lacked on, on both sides, both on the international level, but also primarily on the Congolese themselves and the neighbors who wanted to, to continue maintaining it? Well, I think there was some, the lack of follow-up. You're absolutely right. This was, a, I think, a very successful initiative where you saw both the United Nations create, well, it was actually initially was a creation of the sub-region. The Force Intervention Brigade actually was... Uh, an African initiative it was then incorporated into the UN peacekeeping mission. Um, and very impressive and quite successful. You saw the large scale deployment of very efficient African peacekeepers, especially the South Africans were uh, very impressive in 2013. Um, and, but that was combined also with diplomatic pressure. This was, uh, I think, a real sea change in the way the United States also dealt with Rwanda. Uh, uh, the United States government had, I think, um, either downplayed or not sufficiently um, uh, taken seriously Rwandan intervention in the Eastern Congo. And under the leadership of Russ Feingold at the time, who was special envoy to the Great Lakes region, the former senator from Wisconsin, um, uh, and under the presidency of Barack Obama, you saw an uh, enormous amount of pressure being put on the Rwandan government uh, from the United States, um, but also the World Bank cut funding. The Rwandan government was, came under enormous financial pressure. Um, hundreds of millions of dollars of financial aid were suspended to the Rwandan government. And so you had this coming together of both political and military pressure um, against the M23 and against the Rwandan government that led to the defeat of, as you said, of the M23. So the question is, well, why wasn't that carried forward? And I think there was a lack of follow-up in that. If you have hundreds of troops in the neighboring countries, in army camps in Rwanda and Uganda, it's obvious that these troops at some point are going to pose some sort of problem. Um, they, they languished in army camps for years, and then some of them re-infiltrated into the Eastern DRC, and one has to ask the question how that's possible if they are under government supervision in both Rwanda and Uganda. Um, and then from there, the situation escalated. They're, I must say, they're also based in an area that's extremely difficult to access without going through either Rwanda or, or Uganda. And so there was a lack of follow-up, I think, by the same actors, uh, the African Union, SADC, the United Nations, um, that, that were instrumental in creating the 2012 and 2013 deal. Either these people are arrested in Rwanda or Uganda, and some of them deserve to be arrested. Some of them have uh, uh, arrest warrants out in, in the Congo. Or you provide them some sort of process of coming back into the Eastern, Eastern Congo. I'll just finish by saying that, in general, there has been you know, a lack of a peace process in the Eastern Congo, right? The last 
process we really had in the Eastern Congo was the Accord Global et Inclusif, which was the 2003 to 2006 transitional government that forged the Third Republic that the Congo now finds itself in, that created the democratic institutions, the, uh, the a new constitution, etc., that gave birth to this new republic in 2006 in, in the DRC. Um, since then, even though violence has escalated, Right? We are now at 5.6 million IDPs. That's more IDPs than have ever been in the Eastern DRC. Even though violence has escalated, there is no real peace process to deal with this violence. What you have is a patchwork of various initiatives. You have a UN peacekeeping mission that's deployed, but deployed without an underlying peace process to implement. And so the 2013 defeat of the M23, during that time, you had a new um, accord cadre as the framework agreement of Addis Ababa that was uh, that was supposed to provide some sort of peace process, right? They were supposed to address both the proximate issues, right? What do you do with not just the M23, but other armed groups, as well as the underlying issues, issues linked to the weakness of the state, uh, transitional justice, land reform, et cetera, et cetera. The problem is that peace deal, that peace process also suffered from a dramatic lack of follow-up. And so you asked the question, what it would have it taken to deal with the M23? I think there was, there was a process. It was just never implemented. You would have had to deal with the M23, either give them something, right? Integrate them back into life or arrest them and let them face, uh, let them face justice. None of that was done. And none of the root drivers of the crises in the Eastern Congo that I just mentioned were also dealt with. And I think that's how we ended up in this current situation. Okay, uh, but the, uh, so on many, I think in many ways, we're talking about dysfunction of institutions here, uh, locally at the Congolese level, but also the international actors who are invested in so many ways. They have troops there, you know, the UN, many countries have troops there. The um, countries on the Security Council typically fund the missions there. So. Why is that that they're engaging in behavior that seems pretty counterproductive? Counterproductive to some. Counterproductive certainly to many, for many Congolese who suffer from this. And I think that's important for us to remember throughout this process is, you know, as we collectively, uh, international community, Congolese, Rwandans, Ugandans, as, as, as they bicker over these issues, there are millions of Congolese, 5.6 million Congolese are not at home because of this problem. Um, it's a terrible toll. So it's counterproductive to them, but unfortunately for so many others, it, it, it serves a, a, a another purpose. Uh, it allows this mess in the Eastern Congo, as long as the Eastern Congo is a mess, Rwanda and Uganda will benefit from it. Um, I think one thing that they have realized, you know, Uganda and Rwanda occupied the Eastern Congo until 2002, 2003, uh, officially, and then they withdrew. Um, and what they've realized since then is they don't need to be physically present in the Eastern Congo to derive benefit from the Eastern Congo. Um, Rwanda and Uganda, currently their largest exports are products that come most likely from the Eastern Congo. So the largest export of both Rwanda and Uganda is gold. Most of that gold, we think, comes from the Eastern Congo. Um, one of the second largest exports is tin for Rwanda. Much of that tin comes from the Eastern Congo. And so having a mess in the Eastern Congo serves some people's interests. It also serves the interests of some Congolese, um, especially the army generals, I think. Uh, you can even see this in the way the army is organized. An army general in the Congo has an official salary of around, it's still someplace between 150 and 200 US dollars for the highest ranking commander in the Congolese army, right? And yet, when you meet with them, they're sending their children to school abroad, they have a large house, they have obviously so much more income. And much of that income is discretionary, either legal discretionary income that comes through bonuses and other things, or uh, illegal income uh, from extraction of natural resources and other racketeering, especially in the Eastern Congo. And all of that income, that discretionary income, comes from being at conflict in the Eastern Congo. If, literally speaking, the, ar the army is invested in conflict in the sense that it cannot, most of the profits for senior commanders come from being deployed in the conflict. And so there are interests by many parties to the conflict to make sure that it doesn't go away. And it would take very strong leadership 
both in Kinshasa as well as in other countries, to say, actually, no, stability is more important. The development of strong, especially from Kinshasa, strong national institutions is important. And I think that even Chisekedi, who came to power, we have to remember, uh, as somebody who had never spent much time in the Eastern Congo, somebody who has never been in the army or ever had a other state uh, official position, really discovering what's happening in the Eastern Congo. And he himself recently, when he traveled to Ituri, he denounced, it's almost as if he himself is denouncing his own state. He's saying, look, this army is a mafia. He, he literally said this mommy, army is a mafia. Um, and he very famously then later on was, went, to, went on to say, Mboka Ikufa. So the, the state is dead. The state is disintegrated. Correct. And but so it's a very striking, striking moment where the president of a country says that his own state is, is, is dysfunct, is dysfunctional, and is broken apart. And so I think uh, there is a realization, even from Chisekedi, that the state is not only weak, but certain people are benefiting from this weakness, this mafia he talks about. So on that point, though, on, on the interest that certain groups of faction may have in the continuity, continuation of the war. Um, for the neighbors, it may serve certain groups in those countries, in places like uh, Rwanda or Uganda, maybe even Burundi. But in the long run, it does not necessarily serve those countries. I mean, destabilizing your neighbor continuously in a country like Rwanda that is pretty fragile. I mean, Rwanda is putting a good showing now, but it's fragile because, you know, the internal dynamics are not always conducive to peace. So while they may justify from Kigal, they may say, well, we need to go over there to guard our, our flank. Uh, but weakening your neighbor, it's just a question of time before those neighbors, either that, that base that you're trying to disrupt becomes strong and overwhelms you. Uh, in the case of Uganda, and both Rwanda and Uganda, they're becoming big host of refugees. Uganda is home to the largest community of refugees in Africa. And I will argue that is in part because of its own involvement in maintaining instability in, in the area. And uh, I can make the case for Rwanda that it's pretty short-sighted in that sense. What is your reaction to that? Well, you know, you're, what you're laying out is a very rational perspective. Uh, but you have to understand that interests are not just composed on a blank sheet of paper by people who look at things in a very abstract, rational fashion. Interest, the state interests of both Rwanda and Uganda come out of the context of who these regimes are, who these governments are, and how they see their interests. And I think one of the mistakes the international community, including the United States, has often made is they do exactly what you just did. They say, there, why would, and, and diplomats have told me exactly what you just said, why would Rwanda have an interest in destabilizing its neighbor? You know, in theory, it has an interest to the opposite. And they read backwards from their own reading of this to say, and so ipso facto, they're not involved. Whereas what we should be doing is looking actually at the situation on the ground, trying to understand these actors, and then trying to, and, and so extrapolating the interest from what we see and not what we believe them to be. And so to answer your question, um, I think the, the, both the Rwandan and the Ugandan governments care first and foremost about their survival. And if you understand the nature of these governments, that are very two very different governments, then you can understand a little bit more about why they are doing what they're doing. The case of Rwanda, for example. Rwanda, the RPF, the ruling party, has been in power since 1994. The president has more or less de facto at least been in power, President Kagame, since 1994. And this is a government that was a former rebellion. The RPF was created in exile, fought in exile, and to a certain extent, it still has the mentality of a rebellion, uh, especially when it comes to security issues in the Eastern Congo. There's a bunker mentality that sometimes sets in. Um, the, the, the way decisions are made, from what we know about the decision-making process in armed conflict in the Eastern Congo, is not always done in the most rational fashion. It tends towards belligerency. Nobody wants to second-guess the hawks. Nobody wants to second-guess the boss. And so in 2012, for example, when Rwanda backed the M23 rebellion, what we know now is that there were some people who said exactly what you just said within the Rwandan government, and saying, hey, wait a second, this is actually not in our best interest. We stand to benefit economically uh, uh, from you know, growing trade with the Eastern Congo. This is, that goes against that. And we're going to be the pariah of the international community if they see us destabilizing our neighbor yet again. They had sidelines, were marginalized. Um, by the president and by others around him, and the, and the hawks prevailed, and in part it's because of this bunker mentality within the RPF. Another thing one has to understand about the, the RPF is, is that 
the 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 thing that inspires most fear within the for the political survival of the regime in Rwanda is not a democratic opposition. There is no democratic opposition in Rwanda. It's been suppressed, dismantled. Um, the the greatest fear in terms of change is from the army itself. Kagame comes came from this army, and when the M23 was created in 2012. They were still reeling from the defection of several very high-ranking military officers in Rwanda. And the M23 was a way of focusing um, Rwandan uh, army attention on an external enemy, an external enemy that's often associated in Rwanda with the genocide. Because um, Rwanda, every time there's insecurity in the Eastern Congo, they revive, they, 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 there's a discourse or a rhetoric around the FDLR, who are, who do include some people who participated in the genocide of, of 1994. And that genocide is a foundational uh, moment in the RPF's history. It's a, it provides them legitimacy. We are here to protect Rwanda against the discourse or ideology of genocide and against further instability and insecurity. And so I think also conflict in the Eastern Congo helps refocus people on this external foreign enemy as well. And so there's a host of interests that make it difficult that sometimes twist and distort the way the RPF uh, makes decisions. And in addition to that, in addition to those dysfunctions of the decision-making process, um, one has to remember that for the Rwandan government as well, as I mentioned before, there are material benefits. The fact that much of the gold that's exported from the Eastern Congo actually is not Cong exported as Congolese gold, but is smuggled into Rwanda and then exported as Rwandan gold, benefits Rwanda dramatically. Um, and so keeping the Eastern Congo weak has both, I would say, a material benefit for the RPF, as well as all of these other uh, reasons linked to the RPF's history, its internal decision-making process, and so on. So I'll just stop there. I won't go into the role. Uganda has a whole other set that we can get into as well, but a set of interests and reasons but for what they're doing, but we all just stop there with you, with Ron. No, that's interesting though. Um, so there is a level of dysfunction within the Rwandan decision process as well, yes. uh, which is driven by all kind of sets of of dynamics. That, as we said, in the long run, I don't think will really benefit Rwanda. It will benefit some elites in Rwanda, and it may benefit Rwanda in the short term. But in the long run, I don't think this uh, instability, maintaining instability in DRC or in any other countries to the benefit of Rwanda. Now, the question that we have a question from the audience when people ask in 2013, 2013, there was a lot of pressure from the international community on Rwanda. And we've seen that also before. What is different today? Why, in the wake of what we see, that pressure seems to be lacking? Well, I think the, there's always a labor of confusion that happens around these moments, right? And what I mean by that is that what you'll hear from embassies is that, well, we're not entirely sure what's happening in these. When, when, when one puts to them, but, you know, Rwanda may be involved, they'll say, well, you know, there'll be a lot of pushback uh, and saying we can't take, you know, we can, we can say we're uh, um, concerned about the situation, which is what they have, um, but they can't go much further without having more evidence. In 2012 and 2013, it was blatantly obvious, uh, including to foreign intelligence services at the time, the U.S. government, um, the British government. They had their own sources, and I'm assuming this is a variety of both human as well as signals intelligence, that Rwanda was backing the M23. It was uh, solid enough evidence that President Obama picked up the phone and called Paul Kagame and said, we want you to stop. Um, and, and this is now well documented. Kagame says, we're not involved. And Barack Obama said, we know you are involved. And so that was the level of the degree of certainty in 2012, 2013. Now the certainty is less, right? As I said before, I tried to frame, to, to phrase my words carefully. There are credible indications that Rwanda is involved, uh, but it's always easy to muddle the waters and you're never gonna find or very rarely find, you know, a picture of a Rwandan army general handing a bunch of ammunition to the M23. It's, it's difficult to get that level of degree of certainty. Uh, and so hopefully that will come out. So I think that's one part of it. There's just, there's not enough certainty given the stakes um, involved. I think also that, you know, our attention has, has drifted. <laughs> you know, look at what's happening in the world at the moment. Uh, the M23 crisis arose at a time of many other, you know, grave geopolitical crises, especially the war in Ukraine. And people are distracted. They're not 
focused on this the way they've been focused in in the past. And so I think that there has been some attention. I think that especially the involvement of the Kenyan president, Uhuru Kenyatta, in, uh, in calling the members of, of the parties to conflict to Nairobi to start a new process is, I think, interesting. Um, I think we should highlight that despite, as, as I said, despite the fact that the M23 surgeons is very uh, disturbing, it hasn't gotten very far. I mean, they did, they took a major military camp, the Rumangabo military camp, and they advanced towards Goma, but I don't, but they've now retreated. I don't want to downplay that, but it's certainly not at the level as it was. You know, why did, why did the international community get so involved in 2012, 2013? The M23 took Goma, right. the largest trade hub in the region, right? And we're a long way from that as well. So I think there's a, a variety of reasons and there has been pressure and there is a process. I think the problem is it's not clear where that process is going. Much like we discussed uh, previously with regards to the 20, the ACOCAD, the framework agreement of Addis Ababa, that was supposed to bring an end to the 2012-2013 conflict, it's, it's not clear where the current process, this Nairobi process, is going either, right? We have armed groups. What happened was the M23 was initially brought to Nairobi under pressure from the Ugandans as well as from the, uh, the Kenyans. Chisakedi flew there, but then didn't want to be seen as engaging only in conversation with this very unpopular military enemy, the M23. And so the M23 were sidelined from the Nairobi process, and a whole host of other armed groups that were cherry-picked by the Congolese government were flown in, and to a certain way, to dilute the importance and influence of the M23. And so we ended up with the Nairobi process that actually doesn't, at the moment, include the most important actor, the M23, and includes a bunch of different armed groups, Congolese armed groups. But again, it's not clear where this is going, where it's headed, and will it actually solve all of these hosts of underlying issues that we talked about before. Okay. So I want to ask one more question before we take questions from the audience, and then I can come back. Uganda, from your description early on, has just has been involved in DRC as much and as long as Rwanda has. But Uganda seems to fly below the radar, both in the Congolese psyche. So when Congolese up, get upset, they get upset with Rwanda. It's, they, they have a lot of issues with Rwanda, the population that is. And Uganda kind of doesn't get much pushback from the Congolese. If you ask an average Congolese, what is Uganda doing in your country? Um, they probably not have a response. They may not even realize what effect Uganda has had over the years. Uh, but they always point to Rwanda, which is, of course, you hear this a lot from the Rwandan ambassador in Kinshasa, who engages often with, uh, with the media there. So why is Uganda getting, uh, quote unquote, to fly below the radar, both in Congo and internationally, and Rwanda is not getting that type of reaction? I think it's a great question. Um, I think that you could even see this when Rwanda, when Uganda sent in its army, the UPDF, in November, we did a, a bunch of polling with the Congolese Polling Institute, and we asked this question, what do you think about Ugandan intervention? And the Ugandan intervention was actually quite popular, uh, even amongst people, or especially amongst people concerned in North Kivu and Eritrea. We crossed with them, and you asked them the question that you just asked, their response was, well, look, the situation here is so dire, we're willing to accept any solution. And if the Ugandans can bring that solution, then hallelujah, let them bring that solution. And so I think in part, it was out of desperation, but they would never have had the same reaction if it had been the Rwandans, you're absolutely right. And so the question is, well, what makes Uganda so so special? I think that, um, you know, part of this is uh, on Rwanda. Um, and I think unfortunately, some of that focus comes with quite a bit of um, uh, negative and unconstructive rhetoric. Uh, so you'll see dipping into sometimes even vilification of Rwanda that I don't think is, is helpful. And I think a lot of this has to do with the lack of uh, dealing with the past that's happened in the Congo. Let's remember that in the Congo, we have never had a really a true truth and reconciliation process. We've never had a transitional justice process, a true one. There was a truth and reconciliation commission composed of former rebels that never went very far. There's never been a tribunal. There's never been a process of digesting and going through this past and understanding what's, you know, what's important. I think that's allowed a certain manipulation of public opinion sometimes. And also, as I said, this unconstructed vilification of certain people. And so you have sometimes even ethnic hate speech being used um, 
uh, against against Rwanda or against the Tutsi community that I don't think is helpful as well. And so, you know, but this doesn't answer your question, why does Uganda get left off? Because I don't have a good answer. I think that there really needs to be more focus, more discussion. What we found, for example, uh, we're about to release a report on the Ugandan intervention, is that, you know, Uganda is interested not only in security, but they're interested in, in the economy. As I said before, they're building a whole host of roads. Um, they benefit from the gold trade. They benefit from oil. Uh, Museveni, President Museveni's entire economic and political strategy resides on gold and oil, right? He's an unpopular president. He's been in power now for uh, 38 years, I believe, since uh, uh, 36 years, since uh, 1986. And uh, he himself is facing increasing domestic challenges to his regime. And so having this enormous amount of oil and gold reserves is helpful for him. Both the oil and gold are linked to the Congo. The oil is on the border with the Congo, and the gold comes from the Congo. And, and so I think understanding what Uganda is doing, why they're doing it, is really key for, and I think actually, if you look back, President Chisekedi, I think, made a mistake in so quickly inviting in the, U U Rwanda, uh, sorry, the Ugandan army for these military operations in last November, because that's what triggered this series of events that I think contributed at least uh, and was probably a key factor in the rise of the M23. And so I think more focus, greater understanding, uh, including by, by Congolese decision makers on the Ugandans would be beneficial. But at the same time, on the economic front, the Rwandans have made enough inroads as well. Rwanda yeah. has a lot of lines that they could exploit in Congo, that they've been exploiting. We fly to Lubumbashi, to Goma, to Kinshasa, and so on. Um, I think there was a deal between Somenki the gold company and Rwandan investors. So to me, it felt like at a the moment there, just for a moment, Rwanda was trying to formalize its, uh, its business in Congo. So kind of moving away from, quote unquote, the looting and pillage of the neighbor's resource, but really trying to do this legitimate business, i.e., you know, the airlines, uh, the mining and so on. But in a way that was transparent, um, it seems like Uganda coming in was big enough to, to disrupt that. Is the relationship between Rwanda and Uganda that bad and irreparable? I mean, I think you're absolutely right. And part of what you see here is economic competition between Rwanda and Uganda over the Eastern Congo. Um, and in part, yes, Rwanda shot itself in the foot by undermining these legitimate, or at least these formal economic ties that you just outlined. Rwanda Air, is positioning itself to become one of the most important Congolese or more, most important aviation companies in the Congo. Um, and a company that is closely linked also to the presidency in Rwanda, I spoke about a company in Uganda that's linked to the presidency that's doing these roads, DOT services. Uh, DOT services, by the way, that has no expertise to my knowledge in mining has also received very, very large mining contracts, the Sakima mining contracts in, in Manyema province in the Eastern Congo. Um, that's the Ugandan side. And the Rwanda's done something similar with a company called Dither that's linked to the Rwandan presidency as well. Um, you know, you could say they shot themselves in the foot. You could say those were legitimate economic interests and they were trying to do something that wasn't just piage, pillage of resources, but actually legitimate economic engagement. But I think part of me also wonders whether they would have obtained, for example, those mining concessions. Wouldn't it have been a Congolese company, perhaps, that would have obtained these mining concessions, in part it's because the Congo is weak and disorganized and a mess that Rwanda is able to maintain its interests in the Eastern Congo. How, it, how do you maintain the Congo weak and disorganized? In part, conflict contributes to that. And so, yes, they're shooting themselves in the foot. And I think there is a certain amount of counter productivity in the foreign policy thinking of the Rwandan government. But in part, maintaining the Congo weak also allows it to maintain its economic influence. The Congo is the largest export market of many Rwandan goods. If you go to Goma or Bukavu, you drink bottled water. A lot of that bottled water comes from across the border. Uh, milk, dairy, mattresses, matches, etc. A lot of these small manufactured goods come from these neighboring countries. And so um, I think that, um, you know, that's legitimate trade. That's the, but one can't help but wonder what would happen in a strong Congo that was able to have its own industries. Would Rwanda and Uganda necessarily benefit from that? And that for me is not clear. So, you know, it's always difficult to know what exactly happens in the foreign policy decision-making process in Kigali or in Kampala. 
Um, but it strikes me that there is a mix of both rational economic interests as well as probably counterproductive decisions that are made that contribute to that process. Okay. Well, thank you. You know, we have a history in the region. I mean, at one point, Zaire was a strong country, a country exactly. also that went and supported rebels in its neighbors' countries, uh, its neighboring countries. Um, but that came back to bite the Congolese. Uh, that actually, you know, uh, came back to bite Mobutu and uh, undid his regime. So that's not far-fetched as a scenario uh, for Rwanda or Burundi or Uganda, that that threat they're trying to maintain for now will come home to roost on their side. I don't know when that's going to happen, but that's always a possibility that we cannot yeah. ignore. So I'll take a question now from the audience. Uh, we have a few of these. So if you can uh, address some. So the first one says, where does the increasing terrorist threat from ISIS-aligned fighters in DRC fit within this context? That, so I'll take so, two at a time. Hang on just a second, Jason. And then the next one is, how might other regional leaders, such as Kenya, play a role? So we'll take those two. Sure. So the ISIS in the Congo is a very controversial subject, as you can imagine. The ADF, this Ugandan Islamist armed group that is based, uh, uh, that has its origin, origins in Uganda, uh, does have, we believe, links to the Islamic State. But I think the nature of these links are need to be, so I, I think that there's not too much doubt about the fact that there are links. It's pledged allegiance. The leader of the ADF, Musa Baluku, has pledged allegiance to officially to the Islamic State. And there are indications, uh, certainly, of communications between the two sides and some uh, financial, I think, uh, uh, links between the two parties as well, although I, I don't think they're terribly substantial. But I think, excuse me, it's one one thing about links, and another thing, very different thing to talk about control. In general, actually, the way ISIS is operating with its affiliates, if you will, in Africa, that's ISCAP in, in Mozambique uh, and other armed groups throughout Africa, is both parties have an interest in, uh, uh, in publicizing their links. But there's, all, there's almost there's very little command and control that happens. Um, uh, and this is because the ADF, for example, in the Congo wants to use its affiliation with ISIS for recruitment purposes, uh, to make itself seem more of a threat than it actually may be, uh, whereas ISIS has an interest in projecting and showing that it can project its influence throughout the world, even though it has very little command and control over these different parties. So I think it's important to highlight that, but it's also important to understand what the actual nature of this threat is. Is the ADF, for example, a threat, a terrorist threat to international stability. It's possible that they are able to threaten uh, Uganda. They're, it's certainly credible that they carried out the terrorist attacks in Kampala of last year. Um, they have not shown their ability to project that, that influence much outside of this region. And so I think that we really need to prevent, uh, avoid going after flies with sledgehammers and trying to uh, say that you know the ADF needs to be crushed at any, by any means necessary. And by doing so, we risk you know, exacerbating many of the other factors that gave rise to the ADF, you know, in unaccountable, unaccountable governments, a lack of go uh, uh, corrupt governments, uh, militarized responses to problems that are fundamentally actually uh, social and political. And so I think that that's the main challenge with the ADF. So how does the ISIS fit into all of this? It plays a role, but I would say within the M23 crisis, it plays a fairly small role. It was the trigger that led the UPDF to deploy into the Congo, and it's in response to that that the Rwandans may have acted. Um, but I would still say it is a marginal player, not the most important player in this conflict. And the next question was, how might uh, other regional leaders such as Kenya play a role? Right. Um, well, Kenya, is, this is one of the, the big news or big new dynamics in this, the current stage of the conflict. Kenya is an actor now. It's never been an actor or very rarely been a very, it's been a very marginal actor until now in the Congolese conflict. And now President Kenyatta was behind inviting the various parties to the conflict, as I said before, to Nairobi in May and continues to be a driver of the peace process, right? So he, the, the Kenyans are uh, trying currently still to set up a regional force 
to back the Congolese army to go against these very security threats in the Eastern Congo, including the M23. And Kenyatta is very involved in, in that. That, of course, the main context of this is the adhesion, um, the very recent adhesion of the Congolese government to the East African community. Um, they are now officially the, 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 the largest uh, and uh, most recent member of the East African community. Um, and the Kenyan government, I think, uh, sees this and is for the first time really seeing an opportunity here for them politically, diplomatically. It helps the stature of President Kenyatta, obviously, who's heading into uh, elections himself uh, very soon in several months. And it helps economically as well. Kenya is very well positioned to become a major economic player in the Congo. Already um, Equity Bank, uh, one of the largest regional banks, it's based in Kenya, uh, has taken, has, has acquired uh, interest investments in the Congo. They took over the BCDC, which is one of the largest Congolese banks. They are one of the largest banking partners now, uh, banking players in the Congo. But not just that, you see many Kenyan actors from the healthcare sector and the finance sector um, really getting much more active in, in the DRC. This could be a good thing, um, uh, but uh, it remains to be seen. So I think the Kenyan government's a new player in, in all of this. Um, I think they have a lot to learn in terms of what's going on uh, in the Congo. Um, but, you know, this is, there are, they also could be a, a, a moderating influence on both Rwanda and Uganda and the Congo as well. So we'll have to see how it plays out. But I think it's certainly very interesting, this new, this turn towards the east that's come with Chisikedi and the involvement of the Kenyan government. Very good. Uh, the other question is, um, is there a country in the region that would have an invested objective interest to see Eastern DRC pacified and become part of the solution? And then, um, one question says, uh, shouldn't it be possible to legalize what is illegal? A Rwandan company should be given a permit to mine coltan for its refinery in Rwanda, and the DRC collect royalties. Those are two questions there so that you can react. Yeah. So um, I think the, the first question, you know, had a very important assumption. It said, shouldn't it be possible that there are objective interests in stabilizing? I think what I'm trying to say is that you know, interests are always subjective. And we have to understand the interests of all of these countries in the region as deeply structured by their own political historical context. And so when Rwanda comes to the table, Uganda comes to the table, they come to the table through their own particular perspective, which is a very particular perspective. Um, and so I think that's the first thing I would say. Of course, I think as you were implying in Mbemba, all of these countries could have could prosper with a stable Congo, um, prosper much more with a stable Congo. The Congo has enormous, vast resources that are unexploited. It has an enormous, youthful population that's extremely dynamic that can contribute to the entire region. Um, but in doing so would have to, would be a shift. The question is, for whom within these countries? It would shift, I think, uh, the, the profits from certain sectors of the population um, to others, I think that's a you mean you mean in in about. neighboring countries. You mean in, in uh, neighboring countries, yeah. and in the Congo as well. I mean, Correct. Congo also. You know, you have to. But yes, in neighboring countries in particular. So I think you know, does Kenya? I think Kenya really does. Kenya has no uh, security interest in the Congo. It's not like Somalia for Kenya, right? Um, Kenya has no security interest in the Congo. They have. They could have vast economic interests in the Congo. And I think. Well, that's but their economic interests will drive their security interests. Pretty soon, they'll find out if they're investing in DRC. They have to ensure that the areas in which they're investing is actually safe. Right. And so that brings me to the second question, which is about you know, shouldn't there be legitimate economic interests, uh, and shouldn't we just be able to formalize these? What's wrong, I guess, with Rwanda in investing and in having mining contracts in the Eastern Congo? I don't think there's anything wrong about that. Uh, I think Rwanda should be allowed to engage economically, Uganda to other countries as well. But within the context of a strong Congolese state that then takes its fair share from that and then build its own country and its own economy, that hasn't come yet, unfortunately. I've seen the story of the Congo since privatization. You, Mbemba, are the foremost chronicler of Mobutu, so you should you know this, you know. Mobutu nationalized the economy. Everything was nationalized under Mobutu. And then with the peace process came the privatization of the Congo. And everybody except the Congolese has benefited from that. 
The Congo has grown enormously in terms of its GDP, but very little of that has filtered down to the people. And so what are, what's my problem with Rwandans engaging in the Eastern Congo? It's the same problem I have with Glencore, the largest mining company in the world engaging in the Congo, which is that they do so on terms that are almost never beneficial to the Congolese themselves. And so, yes, the Congo should be able to, to do this, collect taxes, royalties, and then build its own country and its own economy with that. But that's not happening until now. And so I think a lot of that onus, you know, resides on the Congolese people and the governments, but also holding these people account. What you see now happening in the United States, for example, is very constructive and productive. Finally, the U.S. justice sector is going after some of the profiteers, the racketeers who have benefited from profits in the Congo, people such as um, Dan Gertler, the Israeli businessman, um, uh, and the various financial backers in the United States that have given him backing. And we now know that there's been enormous corruption. Glencore, the largest mining company in the world, just settled uh, to the tune of billions of dollars of corruption case lodged against them. And we know now, because of these corruption cases, that they were it's, it's giving hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, Gertler, Glencore, and others, to intermediaries in the Congo. And so my problem with this international investing is this. There's a racket that benefits many people, but not the Congolese. Very good. Um, we are slowly getting closer to um, <laughs> our deadline here in terms of time. Where To go back to, you know, we talked a lot about the drives of this tension, uh, Uganda, Rwanda, DRC internally, and so on. Two questions that I think still warrant your, your reaction. One. Is the conflict between Rwanda and Uganda beyond repair? Can they settle the score? I don't know what's driving it. That has been a mystery for a lot of us who study the region. But then two, what will it take to have real peace between Rwanda and DRC? I think uh, real peace will hold mutual respect between the two countries. And I think that that I think some of some of the way, you know, part of this process has been successful. Rwanda reopened an embassy uh, in the Congo. The Congolese have an embassy that's usually not staffed in, in Kigali. And I think that's a good thing. I think um, so part of it's a political process where you need governments. And, you know, for the most part, both Chisekedi and his predecessor, Kabila, wanted to engage with, with Rwanda. Um, uh, and so I think that's, that's positive and that needs to continue. But at the same time, um, you have to have to be strong, or the Congolese need to be strong, as well as their international partners need to be strong in denouncing any sort of military intervention on the part of, of Rwandans in the Eastern Congo. And I think that's still what's lacking uh, a little bit. Um, so, you know, what's the solution to this? I think we know the solution. It's, it's abiding by international law. It's uh, respecting each other's borders and each other's sovereignty. And it's mutual respect. Part of that, I think, uh, gets back to uh, uh, you know the issue of edu of education in both countries. There are stereotypes about each country that prove that are not helpful. I think uh, in this broader process. And so, in moments of crises, it's easy for populist politicians in the Congo certainly to say um, Rwanda is to blame for everything. That's a very it's a knee jerk reflex. Um, and, and I don't think that's constructive, and that's also because of this lack of education, I think, that's happened in the Congo about, you know, what Rwanda's role is in the Eastern Congo, the history of this, uh, and what the way forward is. The fact that this is not, you know, the fault of the Rwandan people. These have been bad decisions made by Rwandan, the Rwandan government, and not by the Rwandan people. To get away from the ethnicization, especially, of the conflict is extremely important. On the Congolese side, I think on the Rwandan side, it's something similar. I think the notion um, that, you know, uh, as one Rwandan uh, yeah, general told me, Ulinzi inafanyiwa nje ya upango. So the safeguarding your country happens outside of your country. You need to be based outside of your country in order to protect your country, right? The, the guards have to be outside of the gate in order to protect the house. Um, Meaning, we need to have troops in the Eastern Congo to protect Rwanda. That also is not helpful, right? Uh, and so I think there, there's, a, there's a process that has to happen within each country and between each country to, to, further, to further these. It won't be easy. I don't, I don't see, as with the reconstruction of the Congo, this is a generational process. Um, 
that will require education, will require visionary leadership, and a lot of support from the international community. And what about the relationship between Rwanda and Uganda? Because that plays a role, obviously, in this. Well, you know, this is, uh, as I said, a lot of this goes back to the tensions between the two countries, but some of, those, some of that relationship has already been patched up. Um, and so for anybody who follows the extremely interesting, sometime uh, uh, febrile, the, what they call the first son in Uganda, Muhuzi, uh, who's the son of Museveni, is also the commander of the land forces in Uganda. He has been, I think, the first and foremost communicator on the crisis on his Twitter feed. And much of that Twitter feed has been about reconciling Uganda with Rwanda. And he himself has been the, uh, the intermediary going back and forth between Kampala and Kigali uh, and taking a lead on the shuttle diplomacy. Um, and so Mohozi is, uh, I think, and, and, and he, what he brought about actually I think is real. They opened up the Katuna border posts that have been closed for years between the two countries. Um, they at least, I think, have led to a decrease in diplomatic tensions between the two countries. And some diplomats are now even saying, suggesting that Rwanda and Uganda, even over the M23, have patched up their differences. And so I think that some of that's already happened. Uh, the tensions are already decreasing between those two countries. I do think that the tensions are, are very deep, though, and historical, especially amongst the military elites of these countries. After all, we have to remember the RPF, um, the Rwandan uh, Patriotic Front that's in power in Rwanda, was based in exile in Uganda military senior military leaders including paul kagame himself were senior army officers in the ugandan army kagame himself was a senior military intelligence uh, officer in the uganda and they helped museveni take power in uganda in 1986 and then museveni helped the rpf then take power in 1994 in rwanda and so they have these very close personal ties but there as you know there's nothing like the kind of hate that also can develop between brothers and in this case, that happened, and the Rwandans and the Ugandans fell out over many things, political visions, personalities, but also over the way to manage the war in the Eastern Congo. And that then led to fratricidal violence between those two countries in the town of Kisangani in particular and elsewhere, where they killed each other. There were hundreds of Rwandans and Ugandans uh, that died in the fighting on foreign soil, in Cong on Congolese soil, actually were just marking another anniversary of the La Guerre des Six Jours for Kisangani in, in 2000 that was devastating for the town of Kisangani. And that was a war fought between Rwanda and Uganda. And if you talk to Ugandan military officers uh, or Rwandan military officers, they the memories of that are very, very fresh uh, still 22 years later in their imagination. And so I think that there has been a certain amount of reconciliation between those two countries, but the tensions uh, for some at least are very deep. Okay. Well, I think uh, this has been very informative. If I were to summarize some of the key points that you, you made, Jason, uh, it's really a question of resetting the vision for the region. It's about rethinking the way these countries see each other. But it's also about the role that uh, both internally, the elite, by that I mean the political leadership, need to do, need to deal with the situation that they're dealing with but also the international community consistency. Um, I think we are a long way from that, if I understand you correctly, but uh, we are out of town today, out of time today. I'd like to thank you for joining us, and I'd like to thank our audience wherever they may find themselves and wish them a great weekend. Thank you very much. Thank all. you.